Welcome to the Musicians Hall of Fame backstage. I'm Joe Chambers. This week's guest is the biggest selling single artist of all time. He sells out stadiums, concerts all over the world, as breaks every record there is to break in the music industry, and one of the best people I've ever met in my life, Garth Brooks. When we come back, Garth Brooks. Gar, thanks for coming. It's an honor. Um, I really, uh, I don't know what I did to deserve getting the number one selling artist of all time <laughs> on the, a show that hadn't been on the air yet as of this taping, but I can't thank you enough as always. You always come through. Um, so it took two hours to sell just 79,000 tickets. Are you worried? <laughs> oh, that's unbelievable. I mean, two hours, I mean, that's a record breaking. Everybody's been, everybody's been very sweet to us. I'm here today simply to say thank you for you. You have shined the light on the true Hall of Famers in this town. There's not an artist that's in the Hall of Fame across town that's alive that won't sit here and tell you the real stars of the music industry are these men and women that play these unbelievable tracks or these songs that people will have children to, get married to, have as their first date or their anniversary songs. These are the true superstars and it's an honor to be here. Thank you for making sure they, they get the light they deserve. See, that's, that's why Garth is Garth. That's, that's why everybody loves you because that's what you, you always put other people first. Well, they're, they're, um, the, they're the reason we stand here. You know, I was sitting here thinking about this stage and thank you again for something else. It's the last time I saw Mike Chapman was right here on the stage. Last time I hugged his neck. And uh, it's the last time I ever will in my lifetime. I see him every day when I close my eyes. But So uh, thank you again for... Uh, that was a special day. And that was, again, that was your idea to... For those who don't know, Mike was the bass player with what is known as the G-Men, the Garth Men, who I guess played on every record you've ever made. Yeah, Alan Reynolds and I talked about it, and uh, Alan said, you know, I'm not too, I'm not sure about this using the same players on every record. I said, listen, this is why I would request it, is because once you get to know these guys, you can embarrass yourself around them, try things. And then I think what, Alan, what's what me and your job is, is to make sure they reinvent themselves every record, push them, push them. And the guy that probably reinvented himself the most, I would think, would have to be Rob A. Jacobs, fiddle player and uh, probably uh, um, Lusinger, the guitar player. He just, he always stayed current, but he always stayed solid and with that foundational kind of a rock kind of guitar that he plays out of Memphis. And just, uh, I think that's the definitive Garth Brooks sound. Well, you got a, you got a road band, which is now with you. Yes. On that, and now you're doing this, since we're on the on the musicians already, um, the, you have there's there is two different kinds of musicians. There's there's a studio musician, and then there's a road musician. Right. Um, a lot of people, you know, think of a studio musician as one that, you know, is, is the one that comes up with the original riffs that we remember. Right. Um, and then the road musicians are job is to recreate it, but they actually have to do more than just recreate it because they have to. Knowing when not to play is as important as knowing when to play Amen. for a, a session player. But when you're, you, when you have to fill um, a stadium, you, there's, right. it's a whole different ball game, right? Yeah, but space is always the most valuable player, always. And I think that's probably where if music ever misses, it's because of the producer or the artist or the player misses that point right there. So Alan Reynolds, king of space. And uh, what space allows you to do is allows you to get inside the music with it and wear it and feel like it's you and kind of own it. You take the, let's, perfect example, we were talking about this today. Off Rope in the Wind album, there's a song called Rodeo that was a single for us. On the record, it's a, it's a good record, but Chris Ledoux said it best. He says, the way that thing sounds live, that's Rodeo right there. And uh, so hearing that come from him, Pretty cool, but you're right. Uh, the solos have to be um, less polite when you're yeah. playing it live. Mm -hmm. That's a great the solo way to has it. to grow some hair. And uh, the drummer, the drummer has to be 
a freaking machine. Uh, dynamics on a studio record, up and down live, those dynamics flatten out a little bit. Or if anything, they just get louder. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, so two totally different players usually. And the reason why is it's two totally different approaches. So when you when you used in a town, answer me this real quick. I've always, every time I've ever read or heard or people said you came to town and then you left yeah. like one day. What can you can you say why you turned around and left? Yeah, sure, man. You're scared like all of us. You know, all of us have. Uh, when you talk about guys and you go, man, why is that guy so so not nice? Whatever. Ten times out of ten, it's going to be because he's scared. We all are. So I moved to this town, scared like everybody that moves here. Mm -hmm and really thought, I was really naive to think someone would hear me, say, hey, here's a million bucks, go buy your folks a house and we'll, we'll cut a record. And uh, you get here, and I was hoping to find straw hats and gooseneck trailers, real be, you know, Cowboy USA. And this is more the suit and tie part of it. That was a little tough for me to handle, because, uh, you know, I handled a little bit of the business end of Honky Talks when we played back there. But a guy named Tom Skinner in the group kind of handled more of that. And Jed Lindsay, those guys were good at that. So when I came here, I realized how alone I was mm -hmm. and left, vowing to come back. And I think the big difference when we came back was in the first day I met Stephanie Brown, which in turn introduced me to Bob Doyle. And Bob Doyle is the reason why, him and God's the reason why I'm sitting here today. Bob is one of the when I met Bob, he was at ASCAP. Yes, same with me. And um, I was, and before you were here today, Kix, the other Brooks. Yeah, Kix was here, yeah. <laughs> the other Brooks. Right. And Kix never changed either, you know, and, and Bob has never changed. He's always been the same nice guy that he was, Amen. you know, back then. So when you, so you come to town, you meet Bob, what was the next thing? People want to know, you know, what happened next, you know? Well, with Bob, nothing happened next. This was a, this was a hard thing for me to understand while it was going down. I met Bob and then I didn't hear anything from him for months. And finally he reached back out to me. And I said, partner, can you tell me why I haven't heard from you in a while? He said, I wanted to see if you were going to stay. It's good. I was working three jobs. He saw that I was hungry for it. I didn't miss a writing appointment. So he came to me and said, hey man, what you think about signing on as a publisher, a publishing deal? I said, sure, I don't know anything about him. All I knew is it paid my rent, 300 bucks a month. Hell yeah. What year was that? It was 1988. So it's paying my rent. I'm working now two other jobs plus a publishing job to just try and keep your head above water here. And um, it's pretty good. Then from the publishing, from the writing thing, he decided, hey, I think we could go for an artist deal. And that's when I told him I didn't come here to be an artist. I came here to get much too young to feel this damn old cut by George Strait. That was my, that was my whole goal. If that happened, I'd drive back home to Oklahoma and, and be happy. That's what I thought. I never heard that. I never yeah. heard that. So I came here and it was pretty cool. And we were lucky enough to get inducted into the Country Music Hall of Fame. They told this story, right? And they said, you know, he came here not as an artist, but as a, but as a songwriter and wanted George Strait to cut much too young to feel this damn old. He said, so and you have no idea what's getting ready to happen over there because your wife and the Hall of Fame kind of plan it all. And they said, please make welcome to sing much too young to feel this damn old, George Strait. I couldn't believe it. My jaw fell on the ground. Here comes George. He looked great. And to hear George Strait sing that one line, a worn out tape of Chris Ledoux, my night was made. It was good. So that's... I came to this town to try and be a songwriter and just wanted to get a song cut by George Strait. It's still a goal I have yet to accomplish that I would love to accomplish. So how, what, was the, what was the next step though that got you in with Alan and, and then recording? So uh, Bob Doyle uh, took me around to all, there were seven major labels at the time. And uh, the seventh label, all seven labels passed, all of it was a no. They felt like George Strait was already here. I guess I a guy named Clint Black that was out that was just killing everything. And uh, I had an NSAI, a Nashville uh, Songwriters Association uh, thing to do. And uh, I didn't want to do it because they'd all passed on me. So there's no reason to do it. Bob said, you're going to keep your word. He said, just go play the gig. I thought, OK. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to show up early in case somebody's not there. I was supposed to go on like fifth or seventh. and. Uh, in case somebody doesn't show up, I'm getting early and I'm getting out of there. 
sure enough, Ralph Murphy, the Canadian, great Canadian artist. He's in the Canadian Country Music Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. He did not show up for that second slot. And the producer of the show saw me and said, hey, man, would you go on in Ralph's? So I said, you betcha. Went up there, played, was thinking I was getting ready to get out of there when Lynn Schultz from Capitol Records came up to Bob and said, how did we leave this thing? And Bob, it, what he said in that next second changed everything. What he should have said was, you guys passed on us. But what Bob said was, uh, Lynn, you said you'd get back with us. They had passed on us already. And Lynn said, you know what? We might have missed something while you bring him in. So here it goes. So when we get our record deal, the first guy I go to is a guy that's been mentoring me this whole time, Jerry Kennedy, mm -hmm. because I know his boy, Brian. And uh, hanging around, of course, everybody knows Gordon uh, because of the guitar work and the, and the songwriting thing he does. And then, of course, Shelby is already working his way into administration in this town. So you knew the whole family. And uh, when we went over there to tell him, we got signed by Capitol, he said, I'm out. I'm like, what? He says, I'm out. He goes, me and those guys don't get along. I said, are you kidding me? He goes, no. I said, well, I don't want to do this without you. He says, look, they're going to give you a list of about 10 names. Producers, bring that list over to me when they do. Sure enough, they gave me a list, about 10 names. He went over there, circled them, circled them, circled them. He said, any of these guys can see you, take it. One of those five names he'd circled was Alan Reynolds. Alan was the first guy that could see us. So we went over to what was Jack's tracks right. at that time, what was 16th and Horton. Bob and I went upstairs, talked to Alan. When I came out of the room, I looked at Bob. I said, no offense to the other guys, but if that guy wants to take it on, because that's a good dude, you could just feel it when you met him. And uh, it was good. And uh, so that's how it began for us. And Alan Reynolds was so sweet. He said, uh, I'll tell you what, I'll produce three songs on the guy. If the label doesn't like them, I'll buy them. I'll eat them they'll be gone and for somebody who didn't have any money that was a big that was a big huge step and I said thank you I'll take you up on that and uh, it was cool and the first uh, the first song we cut was Not Counting You which turned out to be the first song on the first album and the opening song of the first tour so that song as little attention as it gets played a huge role in our career Alan signs you or takes you in. How did you get the G-Men? So Alan and I are sitting and he goes, we're talking about players. I said, Alan, there's only one guy that's been on every session for me, demos, everything that I need. I said, it's, and he, he's the bass player. And Alan kind of smiles at me and he says, the only guy that I'm going to hold tight on is the bass player too. And I thought, well, we're dead. And I, I said, it was Mike Chapman. And he, it's cool. He spun his paper around, pushed it over, and in bass he has Mike Chapman. Mm -hmm. So that was a good thing right there. Mm -hmm. That's when he told me about Mike has a brother from another mother kind of thing, a guy named Milton Sledge. Kind of, they breathe in, breathe out together, mm -hmm. Muscle Shoals guys. Mm -hmm. He says, I use a guy named Chris Lusinger on uh, all the crystal stuff. He says, I really feel like he's got a sound that's untapped and can go a lot, uh, can expand out a lot further that you want to go. Um, I said, okay. He said, how about piano playing? He says, it's got to be Bobby Wood. He said, Bobby Wood's got the touch that, that you'll like. Look, because, you know, you're doing uh, kind of guitar demos with him. He said, I'm going to try a guy named Mark Stevens on acoustic. And we tried Mark, and he also liked uh, Christopher, Johnny Christopher. And he also liked Pat Alger, who was right in the building as a writer for him anyway. And uh, funny, we ended up using Christopher and Alger on the Thunder Rolls and used Johnny Christopher on Unanswered Prayers and then brought Cass Stevens back to overdub on it and kind of stayed with Cass Stevens uh, from there forward. And then um, the only guy that, you know, had left were the two specialty guys, Steel and Fiddle. And uh, he'd brought in Buddy Spiker. Buddy Spiker was a great guy, but Rob had done all of our demos, mm -hmm. of course. And so he said, you want to give your guy a chance? I said, I'd love to. Rob came in and, and Alan just fell in love with him. They communicated very well. Come to find out Rob is classically trained. Talk about a hillbilly fiddler, but he's classically trained. So him and Alan were on perfect wavelength. And then Bruce Bouton, steel player, he had done some stuff for Kathy Matea. 
which Alan was doing as well. And uh, he said, this cat's got a really kind of a smooth style and he can play all kinds of steel styles from Western Swing, straight country. And uh, he's from the East, he's from Virginia. So he also knows the Appalachian stuff and stuff too. So it was cool, man. And that was the assemblance of the G-Man, the seven guys. One of the most important one though, was the guy that sent the board. It was Mark Miller. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mark was just somebody that, that Alan found that loved music, was a guitar player himself and a good one. Uh, but they got along great. And Alan trusted Mark's hearing for mic, for micing stuff. And also his, his specialty was mixing, man. Unbelievable mixer. And, and Alan would never let him use automation. So he had to play his board like the guys mm -hmm. played their instrument. So when we all sit up here on the stage, I looked around and said, this is good that all these guys were included. I forgot one guy in the whole thing that should have been in with the G-Man because without, without this person, my sound would not be what it was. I looked right at her and it's Trisha. Yeah. She sang on over 77 songs of ours of the first hundred ones. So she has been that Garth sound forever. That's that harmony, that's that sound. And that's the only regret I had from that night was she should have been in on it because, man, background vocalists, and even though she's an artist herself, background vocals like Patty Loveless' Sister Vince, mm -hmm. you don't get to where you're at without those singers and those voices. Same way you don't get to where you're at without those guitar players and those drummers. So uh, that was my only miss for the night, but that's the G-Men, including Mark Miller and Alan Reynolds, and uh, just uh, I'm lucky to have known them uh, in a pretty damn good time for us and for country music. I think everybody feels the same way. When you came in the night we did the, your benefit for the kids here. Yes. That was, you, you said, you just walked in, you kept walking in the back door, you said, um, have you seen Stardom 10 feet from Stardom? Oh yeah, 10 feet, yeah. And you were talking about the, those singers, how, how and important and that was and everything. That's everything, man. I, that's why I love the movie Ray. Uh, <laughs> Ray showed you exactly what the difference was. And that difference is what gets you in the door, you know? You got to carry the ball from there, and hopefully there are people that'll help you. If not, you're dead. But that difference, those guys that were willing to play those licks on not counting you, that whole start, flat, pa, do, da, 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 very non-traditional country, but became very traditional country. From that all the way to the dance, that record was a big variation. Fences would come, and fences would be even more of a variation from thunder rolls to wolves and everything in between. So these guys were pushed to the limit to recreate themselves and reinvent themselves. And I think they answered the call brilliantly. When we come back in just a second, I want to talk about the dance. Got it. See you in a second. The Musicians Hall of Fame and Museum has been celebrating the men and women who make the music of our lives since 2006. The Musicians Hall of Fame is the one and only museum in the world that honors the talented musicians who played on the greatest recordings of all time. It's a music city, huh? It's, uh, I mean, where else are you going to get the cats, all the cats that are in this room? The Grammy Museum Gallery at the Musicians Hall of Fame is an interactive facility that allows guests to explore the process of making a recording. Take drum lessons with Ringo Starr. Sing on stage with Ray Charles. Write a song with Desmond Child, rap with Nelly, or be Garth Brooks in our recording studio experience. Located in the heart of downtown Nashville, in the first floor of the historic Nashville Municipal Auditorium. Come see what you've heard at the Musicians Hall of Fame and Museum. Hi, I'm Tyler Rudesheim, Director of Events at the Musicians Hall of Fame and Museum. Located within the historic National Municipal Auditorium, the Musicians Hall of Fame and Museum is one of the most unique spaces in downtown Nashville, offering a versatile environment that caters to events of all sizes. Your guests will love this truly national experience. We specialize in corporate dinners, music industry events, receptions, and more. Contact me today to book your next event. Welcome back to Musicians Hall of Fame backstage with Garth Brooks. Garth, we were we finished talking about the G-Men for a minute here, but you mentioned the dance, which is, it's, just, it's not just a, another song. I mean, it crossed every boundary. People have used it for so yes. many different moments in their lives, you know. 
And it is so true, and it's such a great song. I want to talk about that song, but I also want to talk about what you, what, how did you find that song, and what, what makes you pick a song? How, what, what is it that, how do you know what song is going to be a hit? You've had a pretty good track record of picking them. Well, Alan Reynolds always, Bob Doyle, the greatest songman ever. Uh, but it's a pretty simple thing, man. I think being normal might be one of the most special gifts you can ever ask for. Being the guy next door might be a superpower for a guy like me because if you like it, if it hits you, then hopefully you'll like it, he'll like it, everybody mm -hmm. will like it. So that's, that's, I think that's the deal. I got lucky really off the top for people to show me, hey, if you like it, we like it. And so I just started doing things that I liked. So I'm at the Bluebird Cafe, Tony Arata mm -hmm. is playing. And Tony Arata starts the dance. So I go, oh, wow. So I come up to him and said, man, I don't, if I ever get a record deal, I'd love, I'd love to hold that song. And, uh, you know, it was sweet. We got a record deal. I called him up. He let me put it on hold. And then I never knew this till 30 years later when we were doing the anthologies. That's the first song he ever got cut. And I thought Tony Arata had had a million songs cut in this town. So uh, it was cool. But the dance is the perfect picture that shows the difference between a studio player and a live player. Bobby Wood created the dance, one mm -hmm. time pass, done. But Bobby Wood could never play it again because that's his job. He just comes up with the licks, goes on, here's the next song put in front of you, you come up with the licks. So Bobby Wood is petrified to play the beginning of the dance in front of an audience because he's done it once and that's usually what a studio guy does where a road guy thrives on it because he knows they're going to come alive when I play these notes and I'm going to be Superman. But a studio guy played it once. Let's move on. Let's go make some other records. So Reggie said, Reggie Young said that. He said, because he was with the high, highwayman and he said, you know, they asked me to go on the road with them. I had to go back and learn what I had made up. I didn't Amen. know, you know, and he said it was hard. It's very hard yeah. because you can't mess it up. Yeah. That's the thing. And studio guys, studio guys, if they mess it up, oh, let me take that again. But live guys, you get one shot mm -hmm. at it as it goes by. And these people, what I love about what people describe as fans, what I love about them, I'm a fan. And I know the solo of my favorite song mm -hmm. like I know the lyric of my favorite mm -hmm. song. So when you step up to play it, I want to hear it played that way, but just a little more angst in it, a little more muscle in it. That's so. why I love Tom Petty's band. They, they played everything like they did on the record. Yep. Except, like you said, it might have had just a little more gas Amen. to it. Amen, because you can stay home and listen to the records. Right. So give me just a little more sugar on Give me a little more cheese. Mm -hmm. Let it taste even sweeter than it is when I go home with the records. You just gut, use your gut feeling for, for a song. Just sure. if, if it touches you, you feel like you have the ears of the public. Yeah, right? there's no equation. Because yeah. the second you start putting math to this thing, it's going to go down. The second you start trying to chase something, like the alternative or bro country, these guys have got to be who they are. So let them do that. That's not your thing. Mm -hmm. My thing is just, I don't know, Garth music, whatever that is. Kind of a mix between George Strait, Chris Du, James Taylor, Boston, Queen, Fogelberg, all these, all these things. Buck, Merle, George, all these uh, ingredients are in. What gave you the, I mean, to, to be signed to, in an airplay on country radio pretty much, that was a real ballsy thing to do to, to fly over the audience. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, and uh, do all this stuff that you'd see at a rock concert, but it was, they wanted it. Man, I, I, you know, another thing, Try to remember that before you ever do this, you're a fan. So I'm a fan of country music, so I know what I want to hear on the other end of the speakers. I'm also a fan of live concerts, so I know what I want. George Strait can walk out there. I can stare at him all night, sing every word with him. He's fine. And the other artist, I'm probably going to get bored with it, right? Mm. George gets away with it because I worship him, right? So you go see Seeger. Seeger now, even though he's like in his 70s now, left side of the stage, right side of the stage, he's all over the place, playing piano, playing guitar. There's your guy. I love Seeger. Go to Bruno Mars. 
Bruno Mars is going to lay down some dance and you're going to feel like the squarest, widest guy in the building and you're going to have a great time, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's pretty cool of knowing what you come there for. And I think people come to the Gar Show to sing like they're the only person in the building. To watch these people close their eyes and they flail their arms and the people around them are doing this because they're just having the best time. It's the greatest thing that you could ask for being a musician on stage. You, our whole staff, and thanks for taking care of us at the last concert here. And, yes. And I've never seen anybody command an audience the way that you do. And uh, the thing that you just said a minute ago, I think everybody there thought that you were their friend. And you probably do know probably half of them, I don't know. <laughs> you probably remember half their names because I've never met anybody that remembers <laughs> names like you do. I can tell you what, they are right though. I am their friend and I am the most grateful guy in the building, hopefully. When people go, what do you want for your legacy? I want people to think that I really was thankful for what I got to do because you watch this business before you ever get in it. It comes and goes quick. How did you even have the guts to leave and I mean, you know. The guts to leave what, Oklahoma? To, well, not Oklahoma, but just leave what you had here and then come back. Oh, oh. With, you know, you raised your kids. The retirement period, yeah. I mean, and then and then it came back and it didn't, it's like, it's kind of like when the Eagles left. I mean, they're bigger than they wore. I think you're bigger than you wore when you left. Do you not feel know, that man. way? People are awfully sweet to us, man. They, they, they let us play the new stuff. They come there for the old stuff and then they make you feel like the new stuff sounds like the old stuff for them. So it's a, it's a sweet gift to give. Yes, they were louder than they were in the 90s. They were crazier than they were in the 90s. They knew the music better than they did in the 90s. And I, you just had to pinch yourself going, this can't be happening. So, so we feel very, very lucky that, um, that our second time around has been as sweet, if not sweeter than the first time. Um, you know, the thing is, we did an exclusive deal with Walmart at a time in our career. And everyone said, are you crazy? And I said, no, Walmart does 80 something percent of all country music sales. I would be crazy if I was going to a company that did 20%, right? Mm. So it's not crazy. So when people go, were you crazy to retire? At the end of the 90s, where the 90s were everything to us. So no, if you've ever been a parent there's nothing better than being with your kids, nothing. So I wasn't leaving something to step down or sacrificing. I left and I got to step up. And if that offends people, I'm sorry, but that's, if you've ever been a parent, there's nothing better than that. And uh, all, all the arenas, the football stadiums are selling out like in record very time. Lucky. Yeah. And I never thought a stadium could be as warm as an arena. Never thought an arena could be as warm as a honky-tonk. But you saw them. But now to get to be touring with the love of your life, with your best buddies that were from college on, and people are showing up, and showing up in the way they're showing up. More than ever. Man, that's, right. a, that's a lucky man. Mm -hmm. That lucky man's name is Mr. Yearwood. <laughs> well, man, I don't, I, again, I... I would I would sit here for a, for a week if you would, but um, I've enjoyed myself. I've I really can't tell you again how much I truly appreciate everything that you've done on camera and off, and and I just want to thank you again, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Thank you, man. I know I speak on behalf of all these guys. Thank you, man. Thank you for trading your life and your family's life because they're everywhere to make sure light shines on these guys that have been put in the dark simply because they're not the head honcho in the bunch, but there are no head honchos without these guys. See you next week on Musicians Hall of Fame Backstage.